Howdy, everyone. Uh, it's Monday, October 30th here on the Wolverine.com YouTube channel. Anthony Broom here along with Clayton Safey, of course, our Chris Ballas. Still on the way back from some bi-week travel, so it is just a two-man show today. A pre-recorded show. Typically, we are live Mondays at 6 p.m., and maybe this premieres at 6 p.m. I'm not sure how we'll decide to do it, but uh, I am here with Clayton. Uh, a lot to get to today. Michigan's off the bye week now. Jim Harbaugh speaks on Monday uh, to kick off Purdue week, although uh, Purdue was not the prevalent topic of conversation in terms of what was being asked. We'll get into all that. First college football playoff rankings come out uh, tomorrow, I, or tomorrow at, I think, 7 or 8, whatever it is. We'll get some clarification on the time there. But um, November Chase is here. Big-time football on the way. A couple big matchups coming up for Michigan football. And Clayton, to me, that's the biggest storyline as we head into the week is that Despite all of the bluster, despite all of the noise out there, it is finally back to football this week after what felt like two weeks worth of a bye week, honestly. Yeah, thank God. There's a football game on Saturday at the big house. Excited for that. Second to last one. Um, so it's going to be – got to kind of take that mental picture now every day or every game the rest of the way when you get towards the end. And then the rest of the year you spend – you know, wanting football to come around. So you got to cherish it while it's here. But yeah, it seems like they're pretty focused. You know, we've talked about it in the past when different issues come up. Jim Harbaugh seems to thrive when when things are chaotic around him. He has a way of, you know, being able to do that. Today, his term was one track mind. Um, and that's about winning the next game. It's about winning the rest of their games. He said last week on the radio that he's going to get a, a tattoo if he if Michigan goes 15 and 0, um, you know, that is very much still at the top of mind for all these guys, especially the players who really haven't had to deal with a lot of it. So a lot of noise around, but you know, focus around Schembechler Hall seems like obviously they're being pulled in different directions at different times, particularly Jim Harbaugh uh, as he deals with this, but it's uh, the goal is to win and, and beat Purdue on Saturday. Yeah. And this is where, you know, you lean on your assistance, you lean on your player leadership uh, to kind of keep you focused and get you back on track. But, uh, we will talk about all of that. We will discuss the playoff rankings or what we think they might look like. And then also take, uh, as we do every week, take our questions at the end of the show. So uh, depending on how things time out, uh, maybe a little bit of an abbreviated episode, but a lot to get to nonetheless. Uh, one of the things to get to, of course, is discussing our presenting sponsor of today's show, our pals over at My Perfect Franchise. Are you a displaced corporate executive or wanting to put your career in your own hands? Or are you an experienced entrepreneur waiting to diversify? Well, as you know, our buddy Andy Ludeke can help. Andy is a huge college sports fan and franchise veteran. Having owned multiple franchises and businesses, using his expertise, he's going to help you find your American dream through a very thorough consultation and evaluation process. So call Andy, put your life and career in your own hands. Best of all, his services are 100% free to you. So what do you have to lose? We've talked about Andy a billion times at this point. Uh, he is a good ally to the site, good ally to our network of sites. Obviously, uh, we're very supportive of, of the cause and what he does for you know our listeners and, and supporters that reach out to him for help. So uh, be sure to head on over to MyPerfectFranchise.net. Uh, contact Andy at 404-973-9901. Uh, to get in contact with Andy Ludicky. You can also book some time with him on his calendar over there. So Andy Ludicky, my perfect franchise. Thank you for your continued support. And we ask that you guys consider supporting uh, Andy and my perfect franchise moving forward. All right, Clayton, let's get to the Monday press conference. Again, it was obviously everyone knows what the elephant in the room is with the alleged illegal sign stealing operation. A lot of, lot of spinning plates, so to speak, right now with what's going on in that storyline, uh, NCA investigation, you know, whispers that you know, maybe there was a third-party firm involved, whatever it is. Back to Schembechler Hall on Monday to listen to Jim Harbaugh speak, uh, answered questions, was very clear. It was kind of like a throwback to what, whatever it was, Big Ten Media Days, where a lot of, you know, a barrage of questions coming at Jim Harbaugh some that he can sort of address, others that he cannot address at all, um, given the nature of, of the speculation and, and the, the allegations and the investigation into what's going on or what's been going on right now. Um, but I think what we saw, guys, just kind of like itching to get back to football, and, and rightfully so. Yeah, I mean, he talked about he spent a couple of days with his family. 
Uh, we know it's faith family football is kind of what he always says are his priorities. But I think the football is probably, uh, you know, right now the most important, it seems like maybe not over faith, but, um, you know, he, he was, he even said that at one point, it doesn't seem like you're interested in talking about Purdue, but, um, you know, that seemed to be what he wanted to talk about. Obviously, if he could speak more about some of the NCAA stuff, I'm sure he would, you know, he kind of alluded to that as well, similar to what he said at big 10 media day, as you just mentioned. So, um, I think one of you know one of my the, the biggest things coming from this is the Wall Street Journal report on Sunday night that Michigan has rescinded a contract offer uh, from Jim Harbaugh that was going to make him the biggest uh, highest paid head coach in the Big Ten, and you know, he said he wouldn't say that's true. He said he, that that was inaccurate. Um, obviously, seems like things have been put on pause there, but not totally. You know the way this is being reported from all different angles and everyone's trying to get a piece of it, including Pat Forte, who I think posted absolute garbage over the weekend on sports illustrated about ball boys. You know, one team was wary of the Michigan ball boys listening into the play call or something like that, as if somehow they would have time to relay that information over to the other sideline. Then they would take that in and make a play call determination of their own. Absolutely absurd stuff. Um, but the way this is being reported nationally from every different angle, in some ways irresponsible, some ways inaccurate, which is you know maybe even worse. Uh, and it seems like that was the case with the Wall Street Journal report. So things put on pause there as they kind of uh, you know sift through what this NCAA investigation is going to be. It's just at the beginning, um, and you know still expect Jim Harbaugh to sign uh, at some point. Obviously, I think that's where things get interesting because Michigan fans are hoping that is as soon as possible. I think it makes the most sense for Michigan to get that done as soon as possible. But, uh, you know, I guess we'll have to see, um, you know, how that kind of plays out from what we're hearing, what our Chris Ballas is reporting over at the Wolverine.com Michigan administration, athletic department galvanized at this point in terms of this investigation as they move forward, how they respond to this. And I think that's, that's reassuring to hear if you're a Michigan fan as well. Um, you know, because, I think initially when a lot of this came out, the fan base was a little bit wary of what Ward Manuel, the athletic department, would do. This is an athletic department that suspended their head coach, probably against his wishes, for the first three games of this season, self-imposed. And, you know, you can kind of understand where they're coming from there. But, you know, it seems like they're a little bit more willing to cooperate, quote unquote, with the NCAA than other schools. Uh, but at this hour, you know, it feels like Michigan is is going to respond pretty strong, you know, continue to, to fight and, and, uh, you know, also look into who is that private investigative firm that uncovered a lot of this stuff and presented it to the NCAA. So, so many different layers of this, I just rambled, but, um, you know, I thought the contract stuff was, was pretty important. And then that, you know, it, it all kind of ties into each other too, with how Michigan's going to respond to this, how he views Michigan's response. If he feels like he's getting the support he needs, I think is really important too, for what he wants to do in the future. Yeah, it, it's worth mentioning, too, he did get a question from a reporter about, you know, if it is a head coach's responsibility to know everything that's going on within this program. And uh, Jim Harbaugh's quote was, I think that question probably answers itself. I was forthright or forthright with the statement right away, but you're asking. And yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, just to kind of reiterate what his statement was, because there has been so much in the news since, you know, really since the last time he publicly spoke or since he put the statement out. Harbaugh did say, I want to make it clear that I and my staff will fully cooperate with the investigation into this matter. I do not have any knowledge or information regarding the University of Michigan football program illegally stealing signals, nor have I directed any staff member or others to participate in an off-campus scouting assignment. I have no awareness of anyone on our staff having done that or having directed at that action. I do not condone or tolerate anyone doing anything illegal or against NCAA rules, no matter what program or organization that I have led throughout my career. My instructions and awareness of how we scout opponents has always been firmly within the rules. Pursuant to NCAA rules, I will not be able to comment further while this investigation takes place. So, uh, again, just not a whole lot that could be said, given that it is an, uh, you know, once it is an active and open investigation, it's like we've talked about before with the other stuff. It's kind of crazy that, you know, you can leak there's stuff that can be leaked to the media, but then Michigan can't necessarily defend itself. Uh, but it is worth uh, mentioning that it was addressed on Monday. And um, you know, Harbaugh says we're in onward mode. It's the one-track mind like you discussed. Uh, I'm modeling it, and I see it throughout the program. And, of course, 
him just kind of shedding light on the report. Uh, this was the other quote today, too. Sorry, I'm rambling now. Uh, you just have to let it play out, cooperate with the investigation, and see how it plays out. Too much of a one-track mind with the team to engage with all the speculation. And also went on to say he's channeling his, quote, inner William Wallace to keep that mindset. Uh, maybe not the best one-to-one -one comparison, given how things ended for William Wallace, but I think that's just kind of where we're at right now, Clayton. Um you know, uh, Ballas is, you know, alluded to the act two that might be coming out soon, sooner rather than later on where this thing goes next. I don't know what that looks like. I, I don't think we know what that looks like right now, but I have to assume a lot of it has to do with the, uh, the so-called third party investigator or private firm, uh, what have you. So yeah. Any other notes from uh, the press conference that you wanted to hit on here? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, that third party, whatever that firm was and whoever's behind it, and again, it's not clear at this point. I think a lot of people are pointing to Ohio State, and there's a lot of buzz that at, you know it, it does trace back to Ohio State at, at some point based on the fact that there have been Ohio State reporters, a, a lot of obscure ones even, local guys who seem to have a lot of information on this. Pete Thamel obviously breaking a lot of the story and trying to come out with new information. That's, a lot of it's regurgitated. But, you know, it just seems like a lot of the sources reside in Columbus at this point. Then you get the stuff over the weekend about Ryan Day's brother being a private investigator, fourth and one. Um, you know, it seemed like Ryan Day passed on using fourth and one, which would be kind of in character that he usually, you know, throws on those short yardage downs and doesn't really trust the run game there. So he passed on using them potentially, um, but not saying it's Ryan Day. It's just uh, a lot of speculation by the fan base right now. And I think that was kind of Jim Harbaugh's point, too, with. A lot of this, it's speculation. It's people leaking different things for different reasons, which are important as to why they're being leaked. And, you know, at this point, you just have to see how it plays out. I mean, at this point, it's worth noting, too, that there is no evidence that's been reported. And you would think if there was evidence of it at this point, it would be reported that you can link any of this back to Jim Harbaugh, that you can link any of this back to any assistant coaches that had knowledge about it. Of course, more is going to be uncovered. More is going to come out. But it's something that I think is a very, very important piece of this and something that a lot of the, the folks in the national media that are trying to get clicks off of this and get salacious headlines out there are not, you know, properly covering or pointing out. Um, so, you know, I think that's that's really important. But, yeah, as for this, it's going to drag on and, and we'll continue to talk about it, I'm sure, as the, the weeks, months and potentially years go on as these NCAA things take forever. So. That's it feels like that's kind of where we're at at this point. Yeah, and it seems like a lot of the speculation, uh, there's a lot of things that are being drawn to conclusions right now. And I think they're based on what people hope happen as opposed to what might actually happen. Um, you know, really, if you really kind of distill this down and boil it down, I haven't really had a story come out in recent days uh, that accuse Michigan of any further wrongdoing. I mean, I think maybe the closest thing to it was the Washington Post story from last week, which was really just kind of a character piece. Or, uh, not even that was that was. See, now I'm getting my hit pieces mixed up. There was a Sports <laughs> Illustrated story about Connor Stallions, and there was the Washington Post story um, about the private firm. And other than that, we haven't really had. I mean, yeah, it's going to keep coming out that Connor, you know, Connor Stallions purchased tickets for Game X, and they went unused. That's not that's not new information to me because we know that that's been out there. So to me, anything other than what happens next in terms of this investigation is kind of irrelevant. And, you know, since I did kind of address the third party firm thing uh, on the, on the stream I did yesterday, but I will just go as far as to say this is that it is a, and we both said this, I think both on the air and, you know, on the message board, even on social media uh, is that, you know, if there is a third party that was, digging into stuff at Michigan and then turning over stuff to the NCAA. That is a horrible precedent to set because you're going to start seeing Auburn fans doing it to Alabama. You'll see Georgia fans doing it to Alabama. You'll see it. Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's just what happens next is going to be fascinating to me. And there's, there's whispers of it. Uh, something leads me to believe, and this is not a, a direct quote, but I'm paraphrasing here. Someone I spoke to about this, whatever happens next is probably closer to what a Michigan fans hope for this story is 
than an Ohio State fan's hope for this story is. And that's, I think to me, that's where I'll just kind of leave it for now. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, if there was some bombshell about something else or evidence, especially with the Washington Post, which seems to have a lot of the information of what that private firm was able to find, then I think it would have been more damning. I mean, frankly, at this point, you could see it as damning, but but really it's kind of been in a holding pattern the last couple of days. And all we know is that Connor Stallions has been doing this, that he spent $15,000, which really isn't that much money um, around that, you know, around 15,000 doing this. Um, so I think you're right, but I, I don't think we can talk about this press conference and not bring up field corn versus house plants, AB. I mean, I, were we going to get to that or what? Well, I thought we already did the week where we discussed, you know, agricultural advances. It really, it's been two weeks, Nebraska and Michigan state. True. But I suppose it's a third. We week. had a, yeah, we had gravity in there and Newton's Newton's laws of physics and, as well. Yeah, this is where you start to see my eyelids get heavy when we start talking physics and corn. Yeah, I thought I lost you there for a second. I know I had to. It was a had to had to reboot myself, so to speak. Um, I mean, there's a, let's call it what it is. We didn't learn anything about you know what he thinks about Purdue or what any of these guys really think about Purdue, other than to say it's on to Purdue now, and that's where the focus lies. I think when you look at what happened, I mean, this week is it's. I, I'm assuming, I'm hoping, the last night game of the regular season. You'll have the noon at Penn State in a couple of weeks. You'll have the noon against Ohio State. We'll see what happens with Maryland. Um, but yeah, it is on to Purdue. Uh, the players that we spoke to, I believe it was, uh, we talked to Josh Wallace and Roman Wilson. I mean, those guys in the building don't seem all that deterred by what's going on. And it could just be someone on the message board made a good uh, point too. It's like, they're not going to come out and say, we're this shakes us to our core and we don't even feel like suiting up and you know we're embarrassed that we're wrapped up in this but knowing what we know about the player leadership uh who's i mean again they've already kind of worked themselves through a jim harbaugh suspension earlier this year it's a veteran team it's a group that's been around much of the last few years i really i'm not i'm not concerned about the team response at all and maybe you know if you're playing something a little better this week maybe that's a consideration but I feel like once you get to this week and you're back to football, playing a team that, again, I think they're a 28 and a half point favorite against last time I looked at the line. I, I, I have very little concerns that maybe there's some rust to knock off from the bye week, but I, I think this team is, is going to respond and we'll be ready to roll moving forward. Yeah, I think so too. Um, because they're like field corn, as Jim Harbaugh said. And uh, to bring it back to that, we got, I mean, we got to bring it up. Do you want to read the quote? It seems like you really want to discuss field corn today. We find it. Well, yeah. So basically he <laughs> called the team field corn as opposed to house plant, house plant, you know, it needs to be watered. If it, if it goes, you know, a week not being watered, I mean, it's probably going to die at field corn. And he said, there's nothing wrong with being a house plant, by the way, which was funny. Not, he didn't want to offend any house plants out there. But uh, you know, you gotta you gotta be careful these days in this society. But he said it field corn, you know, you could you could drop a, a seed of field corn in between a you know in a sidewalk crack and it would it would start sprouting and then it would in stock like fashion, he said, uh, it would produce, it would start to produce, and that's what this team is like. They'll play, you know, in any weather, things don't have to be set perfectly for them. They'll play at night, they'll play at noon, they'll play at 3:30, they'll play whenever you want them to. Um and I thought that was a decent way, and he was responding to a question about night, you know, playing night games in the cold in November, all that. But it, it kind of tied everything together. Where it is true, I mean, this team has had a lot of potential distractions throughout the year, throughout the off season. I mean, throughout the last couple years, and they've been able to to weather those. So, field corn, you know, you don't want to offend any house plants out there. But I thought it was a, a pretty apt analogy that you know kind of sums up where this team's at at this point. And, you know, I think you're right. I mean, they're prepared. They're ready to go. They're focusing on Purdue. They got a jump start on them. They also, we talked to JJ McCarthy last Monday. He had said he already watched the all 22 of Penn state versus Ohio state. I mean, so they got a chance to look ahead a little bit too. Um, and from what, what everything that we've heard about this investigation and everything, the, the way that it's galvanized this Michigan team, that they're even maybe a little bit more fired up going into this stretch run. So I think they're going to be ready to go. You have to also mention that Purdue is no good this year. Uh, I think, what, two and five right now. Um, so that's an element here as well, or two and six. So 
I think it's going to be a, a game where they can shake off some of that rust if they have any, and they'll be able to to move forward, push on towards Penn State. And I think this is a pretty fresh, healthy team that that is ready to go. And then another nugget too from the press conference: Kalal Mullings back practicing. So that'll be nice to see him if he's able to go on Saturday night, get that backfield at full strength, and then you got all your horses. I think you know, as healthy as you can be heading into November for what is going to be a, a playoff type of stretch. We had field corn, we had house plants, we had the talk of buffaloes in a storm today. That was an anecdote. That, that was another Wilson great shared. one. Yeah. Uh, I feel like the coverall bingo card is starting to fill up here as we get into the late stages of the season of the Harbaugh isms and and the players drop them now too. It's you know it really is a, a a team that is the embodiment of its head coach. So uh, I think that'll that'll probably do it for Monday press conference talk here. Uh, before we get into college football playoff rankings. And of course, just as I was ready to do the ad read, it slipped away from here. Uh, we want to talk about our buddies, new friend of the podcast, uh, not a new friend of the site, our guy, John West and Genesis Solutions Credit Card Processing. Uh, hey, business owners, modernize and improve your business with Genesis. Guaranteed to improve your rates, their cutting edge system seamlessly integrates with QuickBooks and most point of sale systems this integration is going to save you time, money, and effort. Genesis is one of the few processors who still offer different forms of cash discounting where you can offer a cash price and a credit card price so you never have to pay credit card fees again. Ask John how you can say goodbye to those fees forever. Uh, Genesis is a natural processor with accounts in 41 states and growing. They proudly serve every type of business with credit card processing, including online businesses, accountants, auto repair shops, plumbing services, lawyers, dentists, restaurants, and many more. Whatever your industry, they have tailored credit card processing solutions to cater to your specific needs. And applying is a breeze with their simple online application. So don't wait another moment. Seize this opportunity and revolutionize the way that you process credit cards. Join Genesis Sourcing Solutions today and take your business to the next level. You can call John West over at 847-691-6388 or visit him at gensourcing.com. That's G-E-N-S-O-U-R-C-I-N-G.com. So thank you to John West and Genesis Credit Card Processing for their support of our show. All right, Clayton. Uh, up to this point, rankings, computer rankings, it's all kind of been discussion fodder. Tomorrow night is when the real rankings come out, the ones that matter, the ones that have the biggest bearing on what happens uh, with where Michigan's at, what their path to the college football playoff looks like. Uh, we assume that Michigan will be in the top four, though some have questioned, you know, strength of schedule, the NCAA investigation. Does that maybe knock Michigan back a little bit? Uh, at the end of the day, we'll we'll see what happens. I mean, it, it's finally, we're getting to a point where it doesn't matter what you know ESPN's computers are saying. It doesn't matter what the AP voters are saying. Never did. Um, it never did. I mean, no offense, guys. Uh, I'm sure we know at least a few of them, but um, yeah. you know, it's a marketing tool. It's a it's a way to build hype for games before these rankings, you know, take effect or they're canon. So, as we head into week one of the college football playoff rankings, um, you know, you've got Georgia up there. You've got Michigan in there. Ohio State, Florida State, Washington, Oregon, Texas, Alabama. I think those eight teams are probably the ones right now that have the most kind of where their name probably matters the most in this conversation right now, you know, as we head to Tuesday night, what do you look at? You know, we've talked about before, you know, how does Michigan stack up with Georgia? You know, should they be number one? Do they have a case for that? Let's take the wide angle lens right now, Clayton, if you're on that playoff committee and you're setting that top four, what does your top four look like? Yeah, it's a good question. And a lot of it depends on, what set of criteria they decide to go with this year. It seems like each year there's a different set and obviously, you know, things change years are different and you have to kind of look at everything because everything's so unbalanced with these teams, who they play and everything else. But, um, I, you know, obviously there's a clear top five at this point. And then there are, there's a group of teams that are lingering Oregon who may be the best team in the country or one of them. And, you know, could prove that at some point this year, Texas, Alabama, you could even put Penn State in that category right now. Um, you know, th they need a little bit of help here, but they still have a chance to knock off Michigan at home in a couple of weeks. So 
I would be shocked if Michigan weren't in the top four. I would be mildly surprised if they weren't number two behind Georgia. But it's a cure. It's a case of resume versus quote unquote eye test on a number of these different teams. I mean, Florida State's resume is very good. Washington has the huge win over Oregon. Ohio State has the big wins over Notre Dame and Penn State, although they have you know kind of struggled and looked shaky at times throughout the year. Michigan has looked fantastic, but they don't have the resume of these other teams, as you mentioned, based on just the way the schedule kind of shook out for them this year. And kind of Georgia's in a similar, uh, you know, a similar way there. Um, I would say it's Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, and Florida State, kind of how the AP has it at this point. That's what I think it will be. Um, but we have to remember with the first release of the college football playoff each and every year, it looks way, way different than it does at the end of the year. Two years ago, Michigan State was in the top four when this thing was released. They were just coming off of a win over Michigan. I mean, several years before that, remember the year when Mississippi State, I think, was number one, and Ole Miss was in the in uh, in the top four as well in the first release, and then neither of them made the playoff. So things change a ton. It's going to be one of the more chaotic Novembers, I think, in college football that I can remember just based on the matchups we still have, the conference championship games that are going to come about. I mean, Texas, Oklahoma – likely to rematch Alabama as long as they beat LSU seems like they'll be the team that will take on Georgia in the SEC championship could two teams from one conference get in how many teams are going to be sitting there with one loss trying to get in at the end it's going to be really really fun but what's your top four I mean do you think do you think that top four is is right and you know how much I guess does it matter I mean it doesn't matter nothing matters right now uh to take the eat at Arby's approach to it and podcast. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think that Georgia at one Michigan at two makes sense. Uh, Georgia is a two time defending national champion. They have still, I mean, for the most part, you look at their schedule. I know they struggled against South Carolina, uh, had to pull away in that one struggled against Auburn, but you know, in the three weeks since then, I mean, a 51 13 win over Kentucky, you know, they, they beat up on Vandy pretty good. Uh, it was 37 to 20. And then they blew out Florida over the weekend. And, um, you know, injuries aren't going to be held against them. Are, you know, are they one of the top four teams in the country without Brock Bowers? I don't know. But right now, there's really no reason to, you know, if you want to make the case for Michigan over them, I think you can simply because Michigan has not played uh, really any four quarter games yet. I mean, JJ McCarthy hasn't taken a snap in the fourth quarter. I think Blake Corum has four carries in the Blake uh, in the fourth quarter. So again, if you want to argue it based on you know the business that you're handling, I think you can make that case if you want to. I'm not making that case. I don't think I would make that case right now. Uh, this is the worst Big Ten I've ever seen, uh, which is so weird when you flip it with the juxtaposition that this might be the the best Michigan team that we've ever seen, at least in the modern era. So. For me, I mean, I, I don't think, you know, so much of the conversation around Michigan is when your schedule is as light as it has been, what do the games look like? And, you know, right now their quote unquote close games are like a 31 7 win over Rutgers or, you know, 30 to 30 or 30 to 3 in the non conference, you know, all those non conference games. Those are their quote unquote close games right now. Um, so again, I think one, two is, is pretty clear. If you want to make the argument for, um, I, I don't know that you can make an argument for anyone else to be one and two. I know different people have their criteria. Uh, I will say this though. I mean, you talk about how these rankings never quite look the same uh, from week one to the, you know, when the playoffs actually announced. I mean, when you look at these teams right now, I mean, you look at who's the most likely to get knocked out of there. I guess maybe Georgia, uh, given that they still play. I mean, Georgia's schedule coming up isn't really that easy. It's They play number 14, Missouri, number 11, Ole Miss, number 19 at Tennessee. They're going to play Bama. They could lose a game or two in there. They could. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens there. Michigan, again, just calling it like it is. Uh, this would be the worst case scenario, but you still go to Penn State to play a game that I think will be a battle. You got you got to play Ohio State, who's in that top three too. So, you know, if you're looking through for the most amount of maybe wiggle room, it might be with those top two teams, which is the interesting thing. But, uh, you know, Ohio State, I, I think that 
even if they lose to Michigan, as we saw last year, there's a path for them to get back in. Florida State has kind of beat up on an ACC that isn't all that good either. Uh, I haven't looked at their schedule. What do, what do they have left here? Florida State still plays Pittsburgh. That's a win. Miami, North Alabama, and Florida. So Florida State's going undefeated, and they're probably going to win the ACC. So I think Florida State is probably in there. And then look, it's really, for me, I look at Washington, Oregon, and then Texas, Oklahoma. Um, you know, if Oklahoma is able to beat Texas again, if they play in the Big 12 title game, that gives them a case to be in there. Uh, Washington, Oregon, you know, if Washington's able to hold off Oregon a second, would they, hold on, am, am I, would they be able to play a second time? Uh, I think so. I think divisions are gone. Okay. So, I mean, that's up in the air too. Oregon could creep right back in there. Really, if, or, you know, Dan Lanning, some of the decisions he made in that Washington game, I mean, Oregon was right there to beat them anyway. So it's not crazy to think that that's a team that they could pop a second time. So I think that's where the fluidity is. Um, probably mo most likely for that fourth spot. But, you know, as we've said, I mean, that's the best thing about how this season has played out is that November for a lot of these teams is, is almost an extended playoff. Like Michigan, Ohio State's a playoff game. Um, Penn State, Michigan is essentially a playoff game. You know, some of these games that Georgia will play, uh, you know, Washington, probably going to get Oregon again. Uh, Texas and Oklahoma could probably face off against each other again. So there's a lot to sort out here and it's going to, it's going to play itself out in the field, uh, you know, on the field, but um, you know, it won't stop from the, you know, can you, here's the thing that I was sitting back and thinking about today. Can you, can you imagine if what's every, with everything going on with, you know, Michigan in the media right now, the college football playoff committee comes out and not only doesn't say that, they can pound sand and they can't play in our tournament, but then puts them at number one. Ultimately, this is about TV ratings and, you know, generating buzz and, and to some extent outrage. And that would be a pretty funny angle to me. Maybe funny is not the word, but interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, it would be funny to see people's heads explode, but no, I don't think, yeah, I, I don't think the CFP committee or anyone that has anything to do, to do with football based on what we've seen, you know, with public comments, thinks that this, you know, there's any of these allegations have anything to do with how good Michigan has looked on the field. Clearly one of the top couple teams, I, I would actually put Michigan one if I, and I know I said that a couple weeks ago as well, I would put them one if I were making this, but I think, I think they're going to be two, um, but it'll be interesting. I mean, like you, you, like you laid out all the scenarios. I mean, there's nine teams with a realistic chance for four spots and uh, it's going to be, I think a hell of a November. It's going to be fun. I mean, I'm just looking at it now. I mean, Michigan 2, Ohio State 3, those standings hold, and that's that last Saturday in November is a playoff game for all intents and purposes. So right. looking forward to it. Uh, again, the games on the field to me is is by far, like let's, let's stop doing this with computers, and, and I'm glad they stopped with the BCS stuff, and like let's play games on the field, and that's what makes what's coming next with the 12-team playoff. This would be a great year for the 12-team playoff. I think it that would we be. would be getting – some phenomenal football. So, uh, but yeah, that's where things stand now with the playoff rankings. I think uh, you have Michigan at one. I'd put them at two, but again, caveat, it doesn't matter. Go out, win the games, play the games and go from there. Uh, so as we do every week to close out our Monday show, we will take questions from Michigan fans, of course, not doing it live. So uh, some of you folks watching after the fact, we'll have to just get to you later on, but uh these are questions from the fort, our premium message board, and you can get access to that and hop in the mix for opportunities like this for $1 for your first month. So be sure to take advantage of that if you're not part of that already. But uh, Clayton, would you like to reach into the grab bag and, and grab out the first question for us? It was Shane Johnson, who, by the way, went on Rich Eisen over the weekend or late last week and gave a shout out to the Wolverine.com. Rich Eisen, by the way, Seems like a subscriber over at thewolverine.com. So join him in uh, in being over there and a lot of fun. He, you know, he said he was following all the coverage over at the Wolverine. So appreciate that, Rich. Hopefully he's listening. Maybe not. Um, but the stars Johnson, been coming out of the woodwork this week for that. Yeah, Dave Dave Portnoy as well, <laughs> tweeting a screenshot from the message board. So he's he's plugged in right now. His Twitter has been hilarious over the last week or so. 
But Shane Johnson says, is this a record going into the ninth game of the year? The only injury in the two deep is a wrist sprain with Mullings. Will he be back this week? Seems like it's trending that way. And that's what we had heard even before the bye week, before the Indiana game, or before, sorry, before the Michigan State game coming out of Indiana, that he was likely to return after the bye. So again, that'll be big. We kind of touched on that earlier on in the show, but it is a, you know, a record in terms of w- what I can remember with injuries. I mean, this is a really healthy team. And it was a point that Michigan made, and some of the coaches kind of alluded to it, and even some of the veteran players in fall camp, that it was a goal to be as healthy as possible at the end of the year. And I think they saw the schedule, and they understood that that was a realistic expectation for this team. It was something they could attain. It's something they've attained heading into November. Um, So it's pretty incredible. I mean, really, you've had minor stuff. You knock on wood, but Mason Graham – playing with, you know, and then he comes back with a club and he plays almost better than he was before. Um, So, you know, there have been really minor stuff. (laughs) Will Johnson, Rod Moore, you ease them into the year coming off of off-season injuries. But uh, other than that, this has been an extremely healthy team, unlike a year ago at this time. And I think that's going to help them in in this stretch run. And that what that's what also makes some of the outrage from not just the message board for but you know social media. Oh gosh, what why is it taking so long for Rod Moore? And oh, he looks terrible, you know, in limited snaps. And Will Johnson, why won't he get out there? This was the this was the plan. This was how it works. Um, how they were hoping it would work. Even last year, it seemed like they had maybe I'm blanking on something, but you know, you lose Cade McNamara, you lost Eric all early, but I, you know, last year they were able to stay fairly healthy, and, to, and obviously at the end, not the wheels fell off, but you lose Blake Corum. Uh, Mike Morris, the, Scooney was Mike hurt. Mike Morris was, yeah. So like they at this point last year, I think they were in relatively good shape, but they feel, you know, it feels like the up, you know, they're on the up and up. I think they're, you know, it's no coincidence that as we've seen guys like Rod Moore and Will Johnson get healthier this team and this defense has played even better over the last several weeks. So yeah, it's a good spot to be in. Um, And that's the benefit of, you know, your starters essentially playing the equivalent of six games right now, as opposed to the, you know, the extra, they have two, basically the way the snaps have broken down, all of the Michigan starters have, you know, basically have two less games of wear and tear on their bodies right now, plus the bye week. So you have to like where this team is at. Had, you know, coming off the bye. And like I said earlier, you know, there could be some rust to knock off, but um, I don't think that's something that could bite them this week at all by any stretch. So it's a good spot to be in, Shane. Thanks for the question. Mm-hmm. We could hit one on defense from OJ. Let's do it. Will any of the remaining teams on Michigan's schedule score 20 or more points against them? I would say yes, because it would be absurd to go through a year and not have that happen. But so far, nobody scored more than 10, just one team, Minnesota scored 10. I mean, it's just insane that we're saying that at this point this year. So I will say yes. He also asked if Michigan scores 24 points against Penn State and Ohio State. Does Michigan win? Um, I'd say they, they would drop one of those games. But it's not a guarantee the way this defense is playing. Let me take question one first. I think you want me to call my shot. I'll say Maryland and Ohio State will do it back-to-back weeks. Maryland, um, Maryland. They, they could. I'm gonna say, they could. You they know, you know that old Josh Gaddis is going to have something drawn up for. Is he for his old? I don't. I mean, it will probably be <laughs> like a, a shotgun run on fourth and one or something. But that could um, work. I, I mean, I don't know. I, it's it's just so hard to maintain that pace. I it think is. it is. I mean, Penn State may. God, that's tough. I, I'll I'll stick with Maryland and Ohio State. Um, as far as question two, can you can you go through that one again? If Michigan only scores twenty four against Penn State and Ohio State, does Michigan win? I in you know while you think of it too, I'll add on to my answer there that they'll drop one of those. I think the defense will still play well in those games, but when you only score twenty four or less, um, you know that plays into the other offense's hands too. I mean that hurts your defense a little bit, puts them in tougher spots. So I will say the way that game would play out if they only scored 24, they drop one of the two. Um, and, you know, part of that would be would certainly be on the offense for sure. Penn State, yes. I think 24 will get you a win in that game. Yeah, I agree. Ohio State, probably not. 
Um, you know, even when your defense, you know, Michigan's defense has played really well um, the last two years against Ohio State, and they still have given up, what, 20, 27 points and 23 points. So they hung 50 I'm gonna say in two it, games. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's, if it's, 24 points, and I would say, yeah, you'd probably split those games, but I think you'd feel pretty good about it at Penn State if you're able to do it. Because that that Penn State offense just does – I mean, Drew Drew Aller has an incredible arm. I think, you know, we saw a big play late in that game Saturday was he kind of uncorks one down the sideline, but they just don't have the offensive firepower that an Ohio State has. So, you know, I, I still feel pretty good about Michigan going into that game. So, yeah, uh, what's next, Clay? A2 Jim says, why would a strong institution like Michigan, even called arrogant by some, allow rivals and destructive forces, internal and external, to so influence their behavior? And who has the desire, cachet, and power inside Michigan to lead in situations like this? One strong individual can negate and unite plenty of disparate factions um, or disparate factions. I agree with him. I agree. And specifically when it comes to the Jim Harbaugh contract extension you know why why let optics which are already out the window at this point um you know blowback um you know backlash rivals that are trying to leak different things why why let that influence what you're going to do with the future of your head coach if something damning came out about jim harbaugh you could get rid of him anyway but facts are facts he deserves more than what he's being paid at this point much more michigan clearly agrees based on the nature of the contract extension that is is being worked on right now. So I say get it done as soon as possible before you get to the NFL hiring cycle, and it, it would make no sense not to. A lot to absorb from the question. I'll say this. I mean, something we've talked about before in terms of what the potential punishment for this is, is that really, and I think Chris wrote about this, I think that Dan Wetzel also said something to this effect of that, really the biggest punishment that Michigan might have from this is kind of, you know, the cracking of the facade of, you know, the, the reputation in terms of being super squeaky clean, whatever we can debate that. Uh, but ultimately I think that it's that it's, you know, you're talking about maybe, you know, uh, maybe more of a Jim Harbaugh suspension you're talking about, you know, I, again, I, I doubt, I doubt that Connor Stallions probably works in college football again. We'll see. Um, but I think there's something to be said. We talked about this on the show I did yesterday too, is there's something to be said about letting the, you know, letting the storm pass, so to speak, be the Buffalo and the storm. And then also kind of crap, you know, being very smart, being very deliberate and being contemplative about what your next step is too. You know, certainly there was some concern that, you know, with this investigation going on that Michigan would, you know, the administration would make some kind of rash decision to, you know, suspend Jim Harbaugh or to to kind of self-impose a punishment before really we even know the the breadth of of what the facts of this thing are. So to me, I think that in terms of a response, yeah, people want to see them fight fire with fire. And that could be coming. I'm not saying it's not coming, but I do think the fact that it hasn't happened as quickly, you know, you know, it hasn't happened in real time as everyone's heads are spinning to calm everyone down. I do think that there is a deliberate reason for that. So uh, in terms of who that uniting factor is, I mean, I, I really, I don't think it's one person. I really do think it's, it's time to get all boats sailing in the right direction. And, you know, then you craft this, this single, you know, this single response, term, you know, institutionally and what you decide to do with your head coach moving forward. But, you know, if this is something to where Jim Harbaugh is not necessarily linked to it and, yeah, people can jump to conclusions that, well, he should have known and that there's no way he wouldn't have known. You know, that's that's a discussion that you can let people have on social media. But the fact of the matter is, is that in, unless there's something that that damns him, that there's no reason to not agree to a contract extension. And f really, it should have been done in the winter anyways. So right. That's kind of my long winded response to that. Now you got to add more on it. Because time has passed now that he, I mean, he, who knows? Um, Sasquatch 616 says what Sly dig on the NCAA will be in Jim's speech from the podium podium after receiving the national championship trophy. There's there's going to be one, right? I remember the commercial that came out after Tom Brady won the Super Bowl um, after the deflate gate thing. 
and you know he had the little line in there roger that i thought that was that was very good i think jim harbaugh is just as petty if not more petty than tom brady maybe not more petty than tom brady but they're both petty yeah um so there, there will be something there will be something and um it will be awesome to to see if that happens obviously still a long ways to go before something like that could come true but but there could well, be a dig along the way anyway regardless and, whether or not they win at all and contrary to popular belief like we're not his script writers either like only he could come up with steel in your spine or field corn or you know the gravitational pull like i, I we're not capable of that but yeah there's going to be a dig uh, and that's the other thing too is that like isn't the only like the best revenge the best response to any of this is to keep kind of destroying everybody and win it all. Um, and then you deal with the repercussions of whatever happens after that. But the biggest response to any of this that Michigan as an institution, as a football program can have right now is to keep winning. Um, you know, this last month of the season, if you want to say that like it's Connor Stallions isn't around Michigan is, is, you know, stripped of apparently the greatest sign stealing mind in the history of college football, whatever you want to call it. But uh, it's game on now. It's football. It's all out there. As long as they play the games, win the games. I think that's the best institutional response you could have to it. Mm -hmm. Wolverine Farm 22 is Michigan going to beat OSU by 20 or 40. And to follow up, will Harbaugh, Harbaugh call day out for being a whiny B word? Won't, won't mm. use the full term there after the game. I don't think he'll call him out. I, I, that handshake is going to be interesting, but Jim Harbaugh has seemed to have grown ever since the Jim Schwartz handshake days uh, at Ford Field back then. I would say it'd be closer to 20 than 40, though. I would predict a Michigan win at this point in the year. Um, I think it might be closer, you know, and even though going into this this game, and again, we're almost a month away, or, you know, still almost a month away, um, you know, just under, it looks like the gap between Michigan and Ohio State is as big as it's been in Michigan's favor in quite a while when you look at it before, but it could still mean a closer game. I mean, games play out differently. The score may not indicate how close the game was, that sort of thing. So I, I think the, um, you know, just it would be wild if they won that big three years in a row. I think it'll be semi-close, but I'll go with Michigan and I'll go with a no call out, maybe a, a dig at the post game press conference, similar to 2021 with the third base comment that has stuck quite a bit and frustrated tough guy, Ryan day. The one thing I will say about this Ohio state team is that they have gotten in a few fist fights this year. And I think generally speaking, like when you pull them into the, like when Michigan's pulled them into that type of game, the last few years, Michigan's kind of pummeled them over the course of four quarters. But what we have seen is that, you know, they do at least like Ohio state's gotten themselves into some of these low scoring kind of physical big 10, uh, big 10 style of games. And, you know, they, they've, they've got that, uh, they've got that steel in their spine, so to speak. So I do think if it's, you know, a knockdown drag out kind of game, I think that maybe, I think this Ohio state team is maybe better equipped to hang for four quarters than the last two have been. Um, but they're not as good at quarterback. And, you know, from, I think that's the key to all this is that when Michigan plays yeah. that game, the last Saturday, in November, it's going to have the best quarterback on the field. And that's God, that's not something that's happened in this rivalry. I mean, 20, 2011, maybe, but yeah, it's, uh, I still, have advantage 11. Yeah. It, has, it has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with what's happened, you know, over the course of this season. I mean, it does actually have a lot to do with what's happened over the course of this season. But I guess what I would say is I haven't seen anything to pull me off the preseason prediction that I made. Uh, I think you made it as well that this team would go yep. undefeated in the regular season. So I like these two from DJ Wolverine. Which non starters do you see having an, an increased role in November? from what we've seen the first two months. I will say I'm I'm intrigued by a couple of the guys we saw early in the game against Michigan State at corner. Amorian Walker being one of them could have had an interception. Um, pretty impressive, his length and, and kind of his speed catching up there. He reacted a little bit slow, but he was able to close quickly. And then DJ Waller almost had a pick in that game as well, pass breakup. Um, I don't think Waller is going to be a guy that's going to get that type of time, but I think Amorian Walker could be if he continues to progress, or at least we'll see him 
in somewhat of a rotation. I'm probably not thinking of somebody else. Um, but then that, you know, ties into his second questions that we can get to too. But um, who am, who am I missing there? Walker would have been mine. The other, I was, I'm split on offense between Kalal Mullings, which I guess wouldn't be a breakout player at this point. Cause we've seen it the last few weeks, but I think that he's going to keep uh, factoring into this. That's thing. a great pick. That's a great pick. Samaj Morgan too. I think there's some things that they can do with him that we haven't really seen them, you know, explore yet. Like, I think he might be able to kind of step in and backfill the idea of what they had for AJ Henning that we never quite saw materialize on the field, but I do think that there are some parallels there. So mm -hmm. I'll say, I'll say Walker, but then I'll, I'll go with those two guys on offense too. I like all those. And then his second question, which starting player on both offense and defense needs to step up to increase your confidence that Michigan will three Pete as East division champions. I love this one. It's kind of similar because, you know, some of the guys we're pointing to could be, you know, in, in the last question could be guys that are, you know, pushing some of these guys that we're about to talk about. I'd say Josh Wallace on the defensive side. He's done a good job. He, you know, he's kind of what we thought he was going to be in terms of a physical corner. He's pretty long. Um, you know, he, he can come up and play the run. He can come up and play a lot of those quick passes. Teams have tried to test him in that area and he's passed. But he's also gotten lucky a couple times getting burnt on double moves twice. Once against Bowling Green, guy catches the ball in the end – or a uh, guy drops the pass in the end zone. And then against Indiana, when quarterback was – was Michigan got to the quarterback before he could get exposed, uh, you know, of getting burnt on the double team against Indiana. So I just think that, that Ohio State, you know, maybe even Penn State, they're going to try to pick on him as well. I don't know that it's going to work, but I think he, he's a guy that I think needs to – play a little bit uh, better in coverage down the field. Um, you know, and then you, you could name countless amount of guys that you think need to take a, a jump, you know, maybe even from good to elite or make some elite plays here and there situationally when you need them in November. Cause this is, this is the time of year when you might need a Mike Sainer still pass breakup in the end zone. Like we saw in Cade Stover last year, like you're going to need those types of big time plays from guys, even if you don't expect it from that guy. Um, so, you know, we could list a bunch of guys there, but I'll say, Josh Wallace on defense, maybe like a Tyler Morris on offense, you know, the kind of a third, third receiver when things are tougher um, against these better teams. If other guys aren't getting as much separation, you just need another reliable option. He's been good. Also didn't have a great game against Michigan state. I thought, um, so I'll go with him uh, on, on offense, but things have been clicking pretty well there. I've got two. They're both on offense. Uh, one, first and foremost, is Ladarius Henderson. You've got Chop Robinson coming up on the schedule. You've got JT uh, Tui, Tui Molau. I believe that's how you pronounce him from Ohio JTT. State. JTT. JTT. We'll just go with that. Yeah. Have some good pass rushers coming up on the schedule. And yep. Henderson, I think, has you know, the tackle situation since they made the lineup switch, I think has been better. It's been steadier, but still waiting to see a little bit more from Henderson. A uh, little, little up and down at times, but he's one, and I think this one's obvious. Uh, it's Donovan Edwards, right? Like getting Donovan Edwards back on track. I should have said him too. Yeah, to being yeah the the you know if Blake Corum's the hammer, you need to, someone's got to be that lightning uh, as as a change of pace back as a guy that can catch the football. I think we've seen them. You know, we've seen kind of that's the other thing about them playing these you know lopsided games is that it kind of cuts down on everyone's workload. So any attempt, we saw them, you know, work Donovan Edwards extra in that Indiana game just to get him a touchdown. But, you know, the fact that they haven't been in these four quarter fights has kind of prevented them a little bit from calling enough plays to get that guy in a rhythm. But I, I've said it all season long and I'm not doing it to curse him or anything like that. I just feel like the longer that we've gone without a Donovan Edwards breakout game, the more violent the return to the mean is going to be. And I don't know when that is, but, You've got some pretty big games coming up, which leads me to believe that if it's coming, he's going to be a huge difference in them. So that would be my pick on on for that particular question. On that note, Ohio Wolverine says, do you think Donovan Edwards' lack of production is the fact that starters only play two and a half quarters this year? I seem to remember a lot of his production, especially against Ohio State, coming in the second half. Would be interesting to see a comparison of his first and second half stats in 2022. He, had, you know, he ran well. I thought in the first half of the Big Ten Championship, he ran well in the first half of um, some other games. It, Penn, Penn State was a second half type of game. 
Did he? Did he uh, bust off a, like a fifty yard run, like the first play from first play against, against TCU? Against TCU, and then he didn't do a ton really after that. If you look at you know the rest of his carries, I I mean. I'll say overall, I think it's going to be interesting to see when Michigan gets in those four quarter games, like how much of the lack of run run game production and, and really the numbers of it is going to come to fruition in those games because they haven't been able to wear teams down and you know keep leaning on it, on them and leaning on them with the starters. Maybe that has impacted things. Maybe that's where the big runs are going to come. So I think there's something to that. I don't think there's necessarily something – to that individually with Donovan, but maybe it's it's all running backs. It's going to happen with Blake too, even Kalel potentially. So I, I think there's something to that theory, though, with what Ohio Wolverine saying. Maybe that's why some of the numbers don't look as good as they have in the past, just because of how lopsided these games have been and the backups coming in early on. Some food for thought here again. I don't think this will be his workload on Saturday, but last year against Purdue in the Big Ten title game. 25 carries, 185 yards, and a touchdown with a long of 60 yards, which I think was one of the first – was it maybe the first snap from scrimmage in the second half or one of the first few? I forget yeah, what it was. Yeah, I think so. Time. Yeah. So may, maybe this is the weekend under the lights. We'll see what winds up happening. Clayton, I think this is probably a good place to kind of put a pin in it and get uh, get on with the rest of the week here. Uh, thank you guys for your great questions. Thank you guys for watching, listening, wherever you get your shows. Be like, or be sure to like and subscribe on the YouTube channel. We're getting pretty close to, uh, I think, 24,000. We'd love to get mm -hmm. that to 25,000 sooner rather than later. So be sure to subscribe to the channel. Uh, get in, as we said before, a dollar for your first month over at thewolverine.com. A lot of intel coming uh, with both. You know, We've got the, the investigation. We've got the Jim Harbaugh contract stuff. We've got our regular game analysis, recruiting stuff. So just a bevy of information available at your fingertips. Uh, for Clayton Safey, I'm Anthony Broom. Uh, shout out to you guys for checking it out this week, and we will talk to you again next Monday night.